my presentation is in two parts. And uh, the first part is the background, more or less the generic information about what Middle Eastern region, as we know it, has contributed to the Western civilization. You know, and so that is in the areas of math, medicine, sciences, a lot of other things. I was going to show a brief uh, clip from Michael Wood's documentary, which I recommend, an excellent documentary. It's called, uh, very relevant to our uh, session, it's called uh, Iraq, the Cradle of Civilization. But when I looked at the time constraints, I decided to just uh, do the homework, and make the notes for you. So in a, on a slide, I put them there. So I will not be showing that, and we'll have more time to cover the second part, which is more difficult in terms of access. You can get the kind of information about contributions on the internet. The second part is, uh, the literary influences from the Middle East on some great Western writers. So I'll be spending uh, more time on that than on the first part. So before I get started uh, with my presentation, I would also like to announce that uh, it's the good news that at City College we have started a certificate program in Middle East studies. And uh, I have some brochures here. Please help yourself as you leave. It is important to add that you don't have to be a candidate for a certificate to enjoy the richness of such courses. The courses are open to anyone with interest. The cards system, I know some of you may not like it. You can ask your questions. But I just think it economizes on time. And also more participation, people can write. Sometimes somebody is making a very good point, but takes a long time. I've done that many times. So it was for that reason I thought the cards would be a good way to economize. Okay. So to, to start with my lecture, or, or talk or presentation. So this is the title, as you can see. And uh, the second part of this slide is what I was going to show you in the video clip. So we can just look at it very quickly. what is uh, so important about the Middle East. So Mesopotamian contributions to Western civilization, writing, first astronomy, first map of the world, first laws, King Hammurabi's code of law, first sciences, first literature, all these first time achievements. And then the three Abrahamic faiths also came out of the Middle East. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Sufism is another contribution which is embraced by the whole world, regardless of one's faith. One can warm up to Sufism, people who don't like uh, orthodox religions, they love Sufism because of its uh, warmth and its openness. I think it is something which we will look at a little bit in more detail when we talk about Rumi, one of the great Sufi writers. So you can read the rest of the script here. And I want to mention toward the end of the slide, you will notice it is very relevant 
that there are two books. Primarily the first one, which says for specific Middle Eastern and Islamic influences, Philip Paschini's recent book, Domes, Arches, and Minarets, a history of Islamic inspired buildings in America. It is an essential resource. Nothing could be more relevant for our purposes. And uh, the author of the book himself happens to be here, so I'm honored to have Phil right here. The second book I have mentioned there is also interesting and relevant. It is titled very interestingly, Al America. Al is the Arabic for the Al America. And as you can see, the subtitle tells you what the book is really about. Travels through America's Arab and Islamic roots. Phil's book is very scholarly, and uh, I think if you pick it up, you really want to finish it because it's so interestingly presented. So it's really a rare book. We're also fortunate today that our event is being uh, covered by a journalist of high integrity who writes for Washington report on Middle East affairs. And uh, the person happens to be here, there's Elaine Baskini. So we are very fortunate to have these two individuals interested in this program. I'm going to just read maybe one or two lines uh, from here. In the news you see um, or hear some names these days. One city is Talafar, T-A-L-A-F-A-R, second word. That is probably the only city, according to Michael Wood, which has continued through all these millennia and survives. It still is there. And right now, there is a, an attempt to take Talafar back from ISIS. So what will happen there, you know, something similar to what happened in Mosul. When Mosul was captured, thousands of people were, innocent people were also slaughtered in the process. And uh, the other city besides Talafar is Uruk. And Uruk, U-R-U-K, it existed up until 300 AD. And the gate of uh, Uruk, you can see that gate even today in some sort of condition, dilapidated, but it's still there. So the continuity of uh, city life, uh, so that is something which is a great contribution from Mesopotamia, specifically Sumer, which is the southern part of Iraq. Writing begins there. It is known as the cuneiform writing, the wedge-shaped symbols, and It is a miracle of archaeology, I would say, that I can hold a little book in my hand, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was inscribed on tablets of clay. And then it was found through rigorous efforts of archaeologists. And deciphering that language is really a miracle. So it is, we are very fortunate we have a lot of archaeologists still working on some other scripts of other civilization. So that's basically um, the information that I would want to share with you. He doesn't mention, but I would like to add, that there are 
other contributions made by people much later from the Middle East. One contribution which must be acknowledged is the translation into Arabic of all existing Greek and Roman manuscripts. The Arabs were, uh, Arabs were great translators and they translated everything they could put their hands on. It was because of those translations availability that the European Renaissance was possible. The standard encyclopedia of medicine of the medieval time was by Avicenna. He wrote this encyclopedia known as the Kanun, C-A-N-U-N, which means the law. And uh, another person who is very, very famous and well-known and made huge contributions is known as Razi, R-A-Z-I. Their names are there, but they're buried in too much verbiage. Uh, I am still um, trying to cut down on the words. He wrote about 200 books. And it was these people who, for the first time, diagnosed smallpox and a few other diseases. And they introduced the idea of wards, separate wards for separate contagious, contagious illnesses. So this was something uh, huge. Al-Khwarizmi is known as the father of algebra. Al-Khwarizmi's name uh, became algorithm. Al-Khwarizmi, algorithm. And so the, uh, algebra comes from the Arab scholars. The Indian concept of zero and the Arabic numerals, which also are of Indian origin, they were introduced to Europe by the Arabs. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the literature part of uh, this presentation. I have to keep my eye on the clock also. The Epic of Gilgamesh, as I mentioned, is the first book of literature known to humanity. Uh, what does it contain? I have it with me. It's a very thin book. You can have a look if you want. If you promise not to, to handle it carefully because it may fall apart. <clears throat> the epic has themes which are still extremely relevant, like the quest for everlasting life. And then at the same time, a very simple recipe for living a contented life. I would like to draw your attention to the recipe for the contented life. If you look at the middle of the slide, the words in bold letters, Gilgamesh, where are you hurrying to? You will never find that life for which you are looking, everlasting life. Gilgamesh, fill your belly with good things, dance and be merry, feast and rejoice, Cherish the little hand that holds your hand and make your wife happy in your embrace. For this too is the lot of man. It's not just that you have to be out on adventures, the impossible adventures. You could be doing these small things and they can, be, they can give you fulfillment. So Gilgamesh was on his quest for everlasting life after he lost his closest friend, brother-like, by the name Enkidu. It's also a good theme of the brotherhood of these two people, very strong relation, so much so that after Enkidu dies, Gilgamesh has no desire to live unless you can, he can vanquish just the very existence of death. And uh, Enkidu is uh, known as the man from the hills, very different 
and Gilgamesh is the king of Uruk and very, very much of a uh, city kind of a person. So the two diverse people can unite and be so close that life would be meaningless without the other person. So these themes run through this great epic. I'm taking you to the next slide, which I'm sure you will enjoy very much if you are not familiar with it. This is a poem inscribed on a Persian carpet and given to the United Nations by the government of Iran as a gift. The words are in Farsi on the right, and, and the translation is, the sons of Adam are limbs of each other, having been created of one essence, when the calamity of time affects one limb, the other limbs cannot remain at rest. If you have no sympathy for the troubles of others, you are unworthy to be called by the name of a human. Interestingly, former president, I hate to say the, use the word former for him, uh, Barack Obama, he used a reference to this poem in his uh, first message to the Irani people on the eve of uh, the new year, which in Iran they call Nauruz. So also, if you want to really know more about the Middle Eastern contributions to Western civilization, uh, listen to his lecture uh, of 2009 that he gave from Cairo, easily available. So nice to learn about the history through some eloquent, elegant speeches, isn't it? Uh, the tweets can teach you that much. Okay. Sadi's prose tales are also very captivating. One prose tale is about Sadi feeling bad that he doesn't have slippers. And he walks barefoot to the mosque to pray. When he goes inside the mosque, he sees a man without feet. So he was complaining about slippers. And he is somebody who is without. It's a very classic tale, which most of us probably are familiar with. And, and you know, and then another very comic, comic um, story about a conversation between a Jewish and a Muslim man. And Saadi says, "Everyone thinks himself perfect in intellect, and should wisdom disappear from the surface of the earth, still no one will acknowledge." his own ignorance. So he has a very open attitude, and he just says that no one is perfect, but we are all hung up on the idea of presenting ourselves as we are flawless. One other story which uh, I think you will enjoy um, a reference to is about the advice. If you know something, of course, speak up, participate, and share your knowledge. But if you don't know something, the best approach is silence. <laughs> and Mark Twain has something, said something very funny on that topic also. You may have heard it, but I want to repeat it. Uh, Twain said, if you don't know something, it is better to act dumb and, and keep your mouth shut rather than open it and remove all doubt. 
He is classic uh, in, in the way he puts things. <laughs> so he is uh, eulogized by Emerson in the last paragraph, you, you can see. And Emerson, very famous American author, wrote about Saadi, about Hafiz, and some other Persian poets. And he made an audience for them because of his stature. It was very helpful. Hafiz is the next author I want to introduce you to. His full name is Shamsuddin, but he's known as Hafiz. Goethe used uh, the title of the works of Hafiz, Divan, D-I-V-A-N, which means collection. And Goethe used, borrowed that from Hafiz to write his East-West Divan. That's Goethe. And many French writers, and Emerson, as I mentioned, they translated his works, and they wrote very highly, very complimentary words about him. Gertrude Bell, the British author, and also someone who was very much involved in the Middle East, spent a lot of time there. <coughs> She translated Hafiz. I think this is very admirable when somebody whose language is not Farsi is able to become so good at it that can translate. So Gertrude Bell uh, introduced Hafiz in a long introduction. I, I, she died in the middle of 20th century. So some of her views are a bit dated for me, uh, but she did a wonderful job. And I want to just read some of her words uh, that she has to say about Hafiz, and the line, the, the poetry of Hafiz. So the very last section has uh, lines from Hafiz. And Gertrude Bell says that these lines are always relevant, whether they are written today or 500 years ago. The first one is, uh, uh, my beloved is gone. And I had not even, and I had not even bidden him farewell. How many times do we think that uh, we have time and then when the time comes, to say goodbye, you are not able to really do a good job, even express yourself. <clears throat> and the second one about uh, the loss of his son. Very painful. He lost his son and also his wife. And he had a pretty you know, sad time of his life at that time. And he says, uh, then said my heart, I will rest me in this city, which is illumined by her presence. Already her feet were bent upon a longer journey, but my poor heart knew it not. The next uh, set of verses from Hafiz. If you know, these are what have made him very famous. If the scent of her hair were to blow across my dust when I had been dead a hundred years, my moldering bones would rise and come dancing out of the tomb. That's an ultimate compliment to a beloved. And the last one is very popular with Nietzsche, the German philosopher, loved this quotation because he, he uses the word words ecstatic wisdom to describe Hafiz. 
So wisdom can be boring or it can be also ecstatic. So he finds ecstatic wisdom in Hafiz's poetry. So this is what Hafiz had to say. I have estimated the influence of reason upon love and found that it is like that of a raindrop upon the ocean, which makes one little mark upon the water's face and disappears. So much for the reason and for passion for love. Okay, I'm just, I have 15 more minutes. Uh, so I want to see uh, what else I can introduce you to. I won't be able to uh, cover all that I, I knew that, not enough time. But Umar Khayyam is very important. And if you haven't studied him, I think it is really easy and very captivating. After every world war, first world war, the second world war, hundreds of Umar Khayyam clubs sprang up all around the globe. And you wonder what is it that is so appealing, so captivating about him. He was basically an astronomer, a scientist, and uh, writing poetry was his pastime. And he wrote these quatrains. A quatrain or rubai is a four line complete poem. So we can look at a few of them together. So these are uh, some of the recipes people want to embrace. Perplexed no more with human or divine, tomorrow's tangle to the winds resign, and lose your fingers in the tresses of the cypress slender minister of wine. Not hard to figure out what he wants us to do. And the theme that you are talking about here is known in literature as carpe diem theme. Seize the day, seize the micro moment of the passing time because it is not going to come back ever. And then the next one, Khayyam, if you are drunk with wine, be happy. If you sit with a beautiful one for a moment, be happy. The end of all worldly existence is nothingness. Think of nothingness as being, be happy. Very hard to do that, but it's, it's good advice. <laughs> and the last one, I think it is. it echoes in John Milton's Paradise Lost also. You know, sometimes it is not a matter of borrowing, it is things happening at the same, same kind of thoughts coming to different authors. I sent my soul through the invisible some letter of that afterlife to spell. And by and by my soul returned to me and answered, I myself am heaven and hell. The words from Paradise Lost that Milton wrote are the words given to Satan. And he says, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and hell of heaven. So it's very similar ideas there. These uh, next two quatrains are very, very controversial because if you look at them, they could be raising questions about the imperfection of the creator. If there is imperfection in the creation, then does it mean there is some imperfection in the creator also? So it's kind of a very bold questioning of the scheme of things and the imperfections in life, in human beings. The second quatrain, none answered this, but after silence spake, a vessel of more ungainly make. So this is the scene where Khayyam is saying, I walked into uh, Potter's 
shop where vessels are made by the potter using clay, the kneaded clay. And uh, this vessel is called of ungainly make, has some kind of a flaw. And so they sneer at me for leaning all awry. What? Did the hand then of the potter shake? The potter's job is to create a perfect vessel. If the vessel is imperfect, then the hand of the creator also has to be blamed. So th this is a kind of uh, um, writing which gave him the notoriety of uh, having some blasphemous idea. Or he could be saying, everything is God's creation and should be accepted on its face value as it is, as perfect. And if you cannot see it, there's the problem with your vision also. Right? It could go either way. The, the, the last two are very famous, and you have probably read them. The moving finger of fate. Nothing can change your fate. You can cry all you want, but once it is recorded, it is done. Okay? And the last quatrain, live for the day. Don't worry about tomorrow or, the, or yesterday. Rumi is the most popular poet in America. I really don't know if it would be the case if there were not some very good accessible translations. Because Rumi is quite complex. And he, he writes um, in language which is not simple. Coleman Barks, our poet, American poet, has done a very good job of translating, making Rumi accessible. He is uh, one of the major founders of the Sufi faith. I love the words which are inscribed on uh, at the entrance of his shrine in Konya, Turkey. <clears throat> what are those words? The last words in the first paragraph. This is the Kaaba of lovers. Kaaba is the sacred place. Whoever comes here lacking becomes complete. It's very optimistic. And the doctrine of uh, FANA, F-A-N-A, which means extinction, is associated with his name. It is the extinction of the ego in order to blend completely with the beloved. The ego is always what gets in the way. So the two poems which are there on the slide, uh, one is about, see, Sufism is called the heart-based version of Islam, heart-based. And this poem that I have on the slide is the best exemplar of the importance of the engagement, involvement of the heart in search, any search. So. <clears throat> I search for God among the Christians and on the cross, and therein I found him not. I went into the ancient temples of idolatry. No trace of him was there. I entered the mountain cave of Hira, and then went as far as Kandhar, which is Kandahar, as we call it today. But God I found not. He mentions all these places he went to. And he traversed the globe looking for the truth. And he says, in the end, he found it in his heart. So that's famous. And the most famous of his poems is the next one, which is sometimes referred to as the Reed poem, R-E-E-D. It is a poem about the pain of separation from the beloved. You could call the beloved as uh, the divine, or it could be the beloved as a person. So it applies to both.
it is on the next slide and before i read that slide with you and this last one here the famous british author somerset maugham he adapted one of uh, the stories of rumi and it is called an appointment in smyrna the original story is rumi's centuries before somerset maugham and the story is about fate that you can't run away from death and it there is a certain comfort that comes to you if you believe that there's a moment when you are going to be no more and then there's no reason to be frantic about worry about how it will all end because it is going to happen a certain way so that is the idea that is still very much fixed in the middle eastern islamic world that the moment of death and the manner of death is predetermined so this story is that um, solomon this very interesting about rumi that he will bring in the holy prophet of islam he will bring in the uh, jewish prophets moses jesus um abraham many others and so he the story is that uh, solomon had these very supernatural powers a man came to him trembling with fear and begged him to send him to india dispatch him to india because he had seen the angel of death his name is azrail looking at him with a look that frightened him so solomon knows this person and he dispatches him to india and then he runs into the angel of death and asks him why did you look at that person and frighten him and israel says no i didn't want to frighten him i was just bewildered myself that i have an appointment with this person in india and he will need a thousand uh, wings to get there so you know that's running away from fate is running toward it interesting uh, kind of a take on that so this the next slide is the last uh, one that i will be able to share with you and listen to the story told by the reed of being separated since i was cut from the reed bed i have made this crying sound anyone apart from someone he loves understand what i say anyone pulled from his source longs to go back at any gathering i am there mingling in the laughing and grieving a friend to each but few will hear the secrets hidden within the notes the notes of the reed the last author that i will have time to Uh, share with you is najib mahfuz and he is i think the um, maybe the second uh, middle eastern author who got the nobel prize for literature he got that in 1988 the story that i want to share with you is a really very simple very short story he writes long novels very complex novels like midak ali Uh, was also uh, controversial and the children of gabal we very controversial in which he is uh, almost making fun of orthodox religions you know just look at his uh, um, words in the first paragraph today's interpretations of religion are often backward and contradict the needs of civilization you know you can put it more succinctly and that is the reason for so many problems in the world our interpretation he is not finding fault with religions because they have in them the potential to bring people together if you mean to do that but we latch on to the negatives which every religion has if your intent is to bring people together why not focus on those areas that have that impact so simple 
So in this story, it's a conversation between a very young little girl and her dad. She's saying that I am with Nadia, who is a Christian girl, all the time. But when the time comes for religion class, we are sent into different rooms. I don't want to be separated. So the, the, the discussion goes on. And um, the father says, well, you are a Muslim. She is a Christian. And so that is natural that you will be instructed in your religions separately. And then she asks him, who makes these rules? Why are these rules there? And uh, who is God? Can I see him on TV? I want to see him. <laughs> and then she asks questions which are receiving glib answers from the father. And the mother is listening. She's embroidering and uh, enjoying the cornering of her husband by this little girl. And she finally says, what is heaven? And who will go to heaven? And she say, and uh, she gets the answer, if you do good deeds, then you will go to heaven. And she realizes uh, toward the end that the answers that she's getting are really not good enough. She says, I am going to be with Nadia everywhere, also in my religion class. <laughs> and the story ends whether or not she will get her way. The implication is she might because she has the implicit support of the mother as well. And the father, the author gives these lines to the father. You can read. Out of frustration, all that he can tell his daughter is that she has to remain a Muslim like her mother and father. But that doesn't of course, satisfy the little girl. And then all these questions I mentioned. And then towards the end, the author says, he didn't know how much of what he said was right and how much was wrong. The stream of questions and had aroused the question marks deep inside him. So it says a child teaching awareness, bringing a new perspective to the father. It, it reminds me of a, a very famous um, statement from the prophet by Khalil Gibran. He says, give your love to your children, but don't try to give them your morals and edicts how to do things, because they will have their own. There's something similar happening here. The last item, and that's the last line, excerpt from his speech. In that speech, which I don't have time to open up and read to you, he talks about the sacredness of knowledge. And he says it comes from a tradition which holds knowledge as sacred. And he gives the example that in one of the wars with the Byzantines, the Byzantines had many prisoners of war in the captivity of the Muslim conquering army. And the Muslims offered to free all the prisoners in exchange for a few manuscripts of Greek writing. So he says that writing is sacred in his culture and his civilization. I am reminded of my recent experience in Palermo, Italy. I went to the archaeology museum there, and I was astonished and very pleased to see a whole room dedicated to the Syrian archaeologist whose name is Khalid al-Assad. He was an archaeologist who was murdered by ISIS because he would refuse to give away the secrets of certain very important historical sites. 
So I think it's really something which we don't register today, because in the old tradition, it has to be revived. He ends his speech by saying what Saadi said, we are all one family. <coughs> it is the duty of the powerful countries to reach out and stamp out the famine, the disease. It is your duty. And then he ends uh, by pleading, please end the misery of Palestinians and also save the Jews from compromising their values too much. Because he doesn't believe that what is happening in Israel is 1988, things have gotten much worse. So I think uh, I would like to say that as you uh, think about this whole presentation, think of the possibilities of what you can do. No, in, uh, for example, in the case of Syria, why am I saying, why don't you do something about Syria? I'm saying you, I can do something about solving the Israeli-Palestinian problem because we live here and this country is the only stumbling block in the solution because we veto the UN Security Council resolution that would enforce the perfectly legal, accepted resolution 242. So I think we all have that obligation, and I appreciate that Najib Mahfouz articulated that so well. So thank you very much. Uh, these are the cards here. And uh, if you can write your question, that will be great.